Welcome to Money, Money, Money. The festival of lights is here and we wish all of you viewers out there a very happy and prosperous Diwali. Now, the last one year has been quite a ride for investors from the highs of January to the onset of the LTCG era and the ensuing market correction to the peaks of August. And then once again to the fall of October. The journey has been nothing short of a roller coaster ride to say the least. However, if you've been systematic in your investment approach, if you've taken care of basics like setting goals and creating a PF plan, then I'm sure you would have weathered this volatility quite easily. And if you haven't, then well, worry not, it's never too late. And we are always here with help. So let's get started. This is the Diwali special and we have a special guest lineup for you as well. Joining me on the show today are Radhika. Gupta, CEO of Edelweiss Mutual Fund, Ashish Somaya, CEO of Motilal Oswal Mutual Fund and Feroz Aziz, Deputy CEO of Wealth Management at Anand Rati. Thanks to all of you for joining in. Season's greetings and wish you all a very happy Diwali as well. Uh, so where do we begin? As I said Radhika, I think we will have the lady uh, you know, uh, kick this off for us. What a year this has been. So when you do a throwback, what comes to mind? So, what comes to mind, so it's been a roller coaster, but in some sense, I think for investors, it's been a uh, good roller coaster. Um, you know, and it sounds strange to say that. I think 2017 was a year where maybe we got very, very complacent about how markets are, how investments are, you know, it's a one-way streak. And I think 2018 showed us some realities. I think what we've seen in 2018, trouble in the credit markets, mid-caps following, following single stock specific issues, this is reality. This is actually reality. And in some sense, it's a good reality check for investors to see, have they set their goals right? Have they done their asset allocation right? Are they investing as per their risk profile? So sometimes a little bit of a healthy correction is also a good sanity check for us. Okay, so maybe a necessary jolt, Ashish, is it just that? Because the problem is everybody is wondering if this is going to snowball into something bigger. I think uh, start first things first, you know, Diwali is about uh, praying to and celebrating Lakshmi. Mm. So it's only in the fitness of things that you conduct the show and see, she starts uh, <laughs> speaking first. Uh, but yeah, I think Whatever this is helps investors yeah, in the market, let's just say. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that, you know, this year has been a reality check, but also keep in mind that everybody seems to be a little bit under the gloom. Mm. Uh, and it's just the last 9 months or 12 months which has actually resulted in this uh, downdraft. If you see any good product, managed product like a mutual fund or any portfolio that you have, if you even if you step back and see the last 2 years or 3 years or 5 years or whatever, I think the numbers are pretty much uh, respectable even now. Uh, so, if you have this odd point of your 9 months, 12 months, 6 months, etc., uh, which has not gone the way you really thought, I don't think there's anything to really worry about. It's just about keeping perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody is always told to invest for a 5-year kind of time frame. And, you know, everybody always expects that they should have a double-digit CAGR. But this CAGR concept is misleading because people expect it should be double-digit every year. Mm. But if you see the past 20 years, once in every five years, there is this downdraft and then things kind of even out. Okay. Yes, you're right that, you know, when the going is not great, everybody extrapolates that into the future and then people start thinking that, okay, is it going to get worse? Now, that's difficult to call. Hmm. But I think the most part of uh, the negative is behind us. Okay. Uh, that's what I would uh, hazard okay. a guess. Well, we'll crystal ball gaze in more detail in just a bit. But uh, Feroz, your initial thoughts as well and what you have seen over the last several months in terms of investor behavior, retail investor behavior. Have people come to you saying, uh, oh, I have more money, should I invest more, the market is falling? Or are people coming and saying that, you know, I don't know, uh, if I'm already sitting on gains, should I book out? What, what's the, the pulse like? See, the pulse, I think, I think we're gradually moving towards a more educated investor. That's for sure. And I think whenever you go through a roller coaster, the roller coaster ride is worth it as long as you take away something. If you, again, forget what your learnings are, then it is pointless to actually have gone through this pain. So I think we as, we as advisors are duty bound to summarize the learnings uh -huh. of what it is. Now, for example, we tell our investors, at least the people we interact with, Clearly that re looking at the rear view mirror and investing is not a good idea. For example, in 2013, when the mid -cap, Nifty mid-cap's PE was 14, people weren't investing. At 46 mid-cap PE, 
they were still investing. So you have you can't just be carried away with the last one two year performance. I think that's one very important learning. Second, I think an important learning is uh, not relying on rating agencies to make debt investment decisions. <laughs> as long as you can take that away and not forget it, then it's good. So I think people are still interested. I think uh, people don't have a choice but mm. to acclimatize themselves to this mm. volatility. You have hit the nail on the head, right? That's where the big debate is right now with respect to what the next you know couple of months, the immediate future really holds. Uh, Radhika, I'll actually take off from what Firoz said. Now, this whole issue about trading agencies and uh, whether that can be a benchmark. Specifically, I mean, you also, of course, look at uh, the fixed income side and it will buy several funds there as well. I mean, for a retail investor who was just warming up to the idea of moving beyond a fixed deposit, this has come as a bit of a jolt. So, what should one be doing? Because as Firoz said, that even if you try and be very smart and try and look at what sort of securities this credit fund is investing in, and as an investor, all you understand is AAA. AAA means it should be good. And then there comes an event and a default. So then how do you ring fence yourself? How do you protect yourself? And you know, what advice would you give? So I think there are two parts to this. One is, one is a part about the credit markets, and, you know, which I will address. But the second and more important part is what should a retail investor do investing in fixed income. My advice to retail investors has always been that if you're starting with debt, debt is not a place to get cute. Hmm. You're doing debt for fixed kind of returns. So, per se. Um, so, if you don't have that risk appetite, if you don't understand debt, if you find it scary, do some of the shorter duration kind of funds. There are lots of categories, there is low duration, there is short term. Mm. Do some of that. If you are venturing into credit, then know that credit risk exists and this is not an isolated event. This will happen. Mm. every year. I mean the banking industry has the best bank in the country has 2-3% NPAs. So it is unlikely that the credit fund industry will not have events like this. If you are not prepared for it, stay away. Okay. Well, uh, before we take a break and start discussing equities full throttle, Ashish, your thoughts on this because what is happening is what, you know, the month of September also taught us that the equity market is not insulated from what's happening in the credit markets. I mean, we, there were days we saw stocks fall 50-60% suddenly. So, uh, do you think these credit market rumbles, will they still flow into the equity market or at least from that standpoint, we've seen the worst? I think uh, we've seen good part of the worst already, but uh, you know where it impacts is that uh, let us say that NBFCs are playing an important role in fulfilling the whole credit uh, requirement, and if there is if there are issues whereby they are not able to raise liabilities and in fact they have to shed their asset base. Uh, what happens is that there will be certain segments of the consumption also like say there is consumption which is leveraged consumption like real estate or expensive purchases like uh, large vehicles and cars etc which depend on funding from uh, say NBFCs. So right now what is happening is that the market has kind of painted everything with the same brush and you know when there is a fall people are not discerning enough. Mm. They just want to sell everything and uh, mm. run away. Mm. So it will take a couple of months or maybe a quarter for people to realize that okay, this is indeed impacted and this is not impacted. You know, here there is an overreaction and here there is uh, no need to react. So I think things will take a couple of months to settle down. But I think the worst is, we've already seen the worst and we know which are the impacted parties and how things are playing out. People are now just being circumspect about figuring out if there is any further collateral damage. I think that's the point. Okay, so uh, Ashish, those are of course important thoughts to keep in mind. Firoz, your view on this whole confusing world of uh, you know fixed income funds and in this environment, the advice that was being given at least till September was that three-year horizon tax efficiency, go and pick a nice accrual fund, uh, even if it's a credit risk fund as they're called right now. But now with this island FS uh, event, is that advice still valid? Uh, I think uh, it's even more valid. Mm -hmm. See, rather than picking up ratings, a fund manager needs to be picked on the debt side. Mm -hmm. Nobody picks a fund manager on the debt side. At least equity fund managers are far more popular. An investor at least knows who the fund manager is. I think on the debt side, a couple of fund managers have done wonderfully well. Uh, there's one which is looked at, one, one thing which people look at is ratings. When, when I manage Treasury for Mr. Rati, for example, uh, you have something called Z-scores. Credit risk funds have better Z-scores, which is a good measure of credit risk. So, Santosh Kamath, for example, Templeton has done a wonderful job. So, point I'm trying to summarize is that don't shy away from debt funds. Choose the best fan, fund managers who have displayed capability of not just going with the herd mentality, but have the courage to pick up credit uh, companies with a lot of analysis. So in that case, your top of three, top two, three sort of names that come to mind? Uh, Franklin Templeton Income mm -hmm. Opportunities Fund, ICICI Regular Savings and Reliance Regular Savings. All these three portfolios, I think, have been designed keeping 
a lot of analysis uh, ba okay. yeah, backdrop. Okay, well, there you go. Those are some ideas in case you're thinking of fixed income funds. We need to take a break on that note. But on the other side, we turn the focus entirely on the equity market. A lot of people out there are perhaps still holding on to their cash, thinking that maybe better levels, low levels are coming ahead. Is that the right strategy or should you start staggering that money in? We discuss this after the break. Welcome back. You're watching the Diwali special edition of Money, Money, Money. We are in conversation with two bosses who run mutual fund houses and we have a wealth advisor. So we've got plenty of advice coming your way on how to structure your portfolio and your finances as you're looking at at, at least the next one year. So the question on everybody's mind, uh, Radhika and gentlemen, is uh, market ka kya lagta hai? Is the bottom here? Have we sort of seen the worst? Ashish, I'm going to come back to you because you did say that at least the, the worst of this seems to be priced in. However, there are still people who are sort of, you know, shying away from entirely deploying their money right now. What should the strategy be? Look, it's like this that there are certain event risks which everybody is watching for. One is like you've been describing, there are, there are certain credit events in the market and people want that, you know, they should get ironed out and you don't hear much more flutter about all of this. So that is one thing that has to go by in the next month or couple of months. The second is that there are state elections. Then there is this whole thing about Iran sanctions and oil prices and all the interrelation. The fact is that next 45 days we have a uh, fair number of events. What any mature investor should keep in mind is they should let these events pass. Uh, I don't think that you should perpetually be sitting on cash because you know the market doesn't make any announcement before and these things can turn very quickly and you know, oil prices go down another five seven dollars and uh, if there are a couple of other surprises you know anyway if you see the result season has been reasonably uh, good I mean there are some concerns about sustainability but it's not that bad so I think it doesn't take time for sentiment to change so I think people, if they're if they're waiting somewhere in this quarter, maybe in the next two to three months, they should. That's the maximum they should spread it out. Radhika, your views on this? So I mean, firstly, it's impossible. I've realized in my career to answer this question. Market ka kya lagta hai? I don't <laughs> think anybody has an accurate answer to this question, uh, let alone me. I would say that things, you know, to echo what Ashish said. Things are going to be volatile for the next three to nine months, but the truth is markets always have a collection of known events around them and there are unknown unknowns that nobody can go ahead and predict. I think for people looking to deploy equity money, is this a better time than it was a year ago when people were very excited? It probably is because valuations are looking better and corporate earnings, as he said, are starting to pick up. Um, I think what has worked for a lot of h and and especially retail investors is staggering out your investments because quite frankly nobody can time the market whether you choose to stagger them out using the time tested stp or sip route whether you choose to balance them using dynamic asset allocation funds which is another way to get at the same exercise i think staggering your investments out has always worked well and that is my constant advice because you can't time the bottom yes it's a better time than it was Certainly a year ago. Okay, absolutely. For us, how are you sort of advising clients to go about uh, their deployment? And also there would be people who are wondering whether there's some kind of rebalancing uh, required at the moment. You know, should the fixed income component be increased just that little bit? Or should the equity component actually be now sort of uh, jacked up because you're getting lower prices? How are you looking at it? So point one is I think equity has enough and more data to tell you that a 10, 15, 20% fall is a characteristic of equity. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable risk? To my mind, that should be acceptable. So 60% goes into equity, 40% goes into debt. If you use good vehicular selection after choosing the right form of asset, mm -hmm. earning 12, 13% to my mind is not going to be an uphill task, especially when debt is supporting the cause of absorbing risk from equity. Debt always absorbs risk from equity. Mm. Use both these assets in, in, uh, in complementary nature. As long as you don't get too cute with your fixed income funds, as Radhika very aptly mentioned. So I'm going to now, you know, um, ask you to put your money uh, where the words really are. Uh, let's say, I mean, if you were to invest 100 rupees of your own money across the universe of your uh, funds, Ashish, what would you go and pick? And I'm talking about someone who's a medium risk appetite investor, sort of a you know middle-aged medium risk appetite uh, investor. Um, should it be more tilted towards mid cap and small caps because that's where the bargains are? Should it be a little more sedate? and stick to more of the large caps what would you do so one is uh, this is a, it's like a personal bias so i don't have any fixed income investment i have only equity investment and if i have to make an investment for say 
five years is a reasonable time frame. If I have to allocate money today, like I said, over the next couple of months, it would be mid cap. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I generally believe that any five year uh, time cycle, you know, very quickly I'll tell you that you know we've done these data cuts. You divide the market into top 100, next 200 and then the long tail. Mm -hmm. And say that the 101 to 300 roughly is the upper end of small cap and the mid cap space. You take any five year time bucket, the probability that some stocks from this bucket will go on to become large cap. Mm probability that some stocks will remain in this bucket but give you a decent return. These probabilities are as high as 40 to 50 percent actually mm -hmm. if you add up both of these. So I think any five year time frame in a country like India, we are living in a country where insurance companies are in mid cap. The largest mm -hmm. asset management company is a mid cap. Mm -hmm. Banks are IPOing in that space. I mean a lot of the banks are in that space. Most consumer durable companies are mid cap. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a long way to go. If you don't get caught up with what happened in the last six to nine months, I am perpetually somebody who thinks that any five-year investment at any point in time, people should have 50% of their money in mid-cap. Mm -hmm. For the viewers, I would like to clarify, when I say mid-cap, I genuinely mean my definition, anything which is eight, 9,000 crore market cap up to 30,000 crore market sure. cap. So don't get caught up with, and, I'm, and when I say mid-cap, I'm not saying small cap. Yes. Because the probabilities <laughs> and probabilities and risk return combinations are very very different. Are are quite different. Okay, yeah. so you would go with the your your mid cap funds at this point in time. Radhika, what would your own bent of mind be if you were looking at personal investments right now? Mm -hmm. Which are the one or two edelweiss funds that you'd go with? So I'm I'm your classic moderate risk investor for two reasons. One, I don't like large drawdowns. I'm in the financial services industry, so life is volatile enough. Secondly, I'm reasonably lazy and I don't have time to do this market timing and asset yes. allocation, which mm -hmm. is a problem. So I like to park money in dynamic asset allocation or balanced advantage funds. On average, that means I have 60% equity exposure and 40% good quality fixed income exposure. That can be 30, that can be 80. And that equity exposure typically is multi-cap equities in nature. So, okay, so you have I a little bit of mid-cap as well. So you yeah, so you have, so multi-cap yeah. I think gives you the blend of mid and large cap. I think there's enough alpha generation. I think if you went down to pure large cap today, uh, you know, you don't capture some of the mid-cap opportunities that Ashish was talking about. But the more important thing is I don't like to do this exercise of should I be 40, 60 today and 70, 30 tomorrow and 80, 20. I like it to be done automatically for me. I like that discipline to be maintained. And okay. usually in this category, I see that over a three year return period, the chance of you having material negative returns is very slim. So that makes me happy. Okay, so you're looking at a balanced advantage fund that takes care of the asset allocation issues as well. Uh, Feroz, now I'm going to ask you for your favorite funds as well. And you can of course name across uh, different AMCs. So let me quickly finish the show and go and check my own list. Do I have these kind of funds or not? But anyway, that's on a lighter note. Uh, your top, uh, the top sort of funds that you like at the moment. See, I think last Diwali, uh, Sebi brought a circular which mm. brought two categories to my interest, very high interest, because I think the disparity between large cap and mid cap is reasonably large at different points in time. Today, Nifty's, Nifty PE is about 24. Some mid cap index have a 40, 45 percent, 45 PE. So that's a large disparity. So I would leave the mandate of moving between mid cap and large cap as a retail investor, if I have to be one. Uh, then what happens is, then the fund manager is able to move between these mm. two. That's point one. The other category of immense interest mm. is the focused equity funds right. uh, which are now carved out in the uh, in the mutual fund basket which replace PMS very well to my mind mm -hmm. so I would use a focused large cap fund mm. because large cap is low on risk mm. you concentrate bring up the risk marginally to get the higher return so to to uh, answer the question point one look at multi cap funds if you are not able to decide look at focused equity only large cap focused equity mm -hmm. if you want me to name some of them at least in the multi cap space I would definitely look at uh, Kotak standard multi cap uh, not very good performance for the last one year but I think it's very well poised in the focused equity side I would definitely look at Mrunal's ICICI focused equity uh, which is 13 14 stocks I think he will go up to 16 17 can give you that one two three percent higher IRR with not too much of a risk uh, different than nifty okay well that's a lot about equity funds we need to take another quick break this conversation continues and we also broaden it out to other asset classes will things like gold and real estate buy for investors attention in the coming year and should you be lured or is it just best to stick with financial assets we continue the conversation on the other side
Welcome back. You're watching the Diwali special edition of Money, Money, Money. We've been discussing fixed income funds, equity funds, thread there. We can't have a Diwali conversation and not discuss things like gold because we're Indians and let's face it, we do like the shiny and yellow metal. And off late, it's, it started doing well. I mean, with all this volatility in the, uh, you know, the equity markets, we've actually seen gold prices shoot higher. Uh, your thoughts on this, uh, Ashish? I mean, uh, it'll always vie with you know, some attention uh, compared to the financial assets that people are investing in. Uh, your views on gold? So it makes sense to have gold and diversify, but my guess is that people are people don't see it as an investment. Mm -hmm. I think everybody in their family has enough and more gold, but they don't see it as an investment at all. Mm -hmm. So if I say that yes, you must have gold in your portfolio because it diversifies and you know because when the risk in financial markets is very high, then gold is a good fallback. I can say all of that and it's a fact, but the reality is that people are never going to view gold as an investment. So how how do they view it as a diversification at all. Hmm. So keeping that in mind, I think that then people are anyway over invested in gold. Okay. So why uh, allocate additional? Yeah, <laughs> right. because, this is the because, point. because it's not like if the risk perception goes down, you're going to sell your gold and buy equity at the right time, right? You're not going to rebalance <laughs> that. So I think we are perpetually just buying gold. Uh, the other thing to keep, I mean, that's an exaggerated statement, but one reality is also that as generations change, I think my grandparents might have bought a lot more gold and then my parents yeah. and then me. Yeah. So I think a lot of it is also getting handed down. Radhika, your thoughts, gold as well as real estate, because, you know, the thing is that now there's this talk of an impending real estate correction or crash, as some people you know, like to use the word, because of issues in the NBFC sector and what happened in the credit markets. So uh, do you think that uh, these asset classes will also vie for attention in the coming one year and then therefore what advice would you give to investors? So I mean there are two three things. One is that you have to separate very clearly what is investment and what is consumption and with physical assets we always have the risk. I mean Ashish spoke about this with gold. The same is true of real estate. If you buy a home for consumption you're not going to sell it just because you know it's risen in value. Mm. So you have to separate what is a financial asset or an investment asset versus what is a consumption asset. That's very, very important. My own bias has always been towards financial assets because of the element of transparency and liquidity. I think, you know, in times like this, the one thing that we realize is that liquidity is very, very yes. important. Obviously, the real estate market has a long way to go in terms of providing that kind of transparency also. Even with gold, you know, just to add to what he said, you can look at gold. In fact, I've always believed gold should be 5-10% of people's portfolios from a diversification basis. But don't look at it, one, because it's done well over the last year. I mean, that's your, you know, past looking bias that we just talked about on the show. And if you have to look at it as an investment vehicle, then look at financial forms of yeah. gold. Physical gold hmm. is not hmm. the most optimal way to make yeah. an investment. Yeah. The third one, by the way, I quickly want to add as a diversifying asset that's very relevant is international funds. Mm. Given what is happening to currencies, I mean, why just look at Indian equity markets? Mm. Why not explore international equity markets? So diversification is certainly very valuable. Okay. Feroz, your uh, final thoughts on the subject as well and across other asset classes, uh, would you recommend anything right now? And again, if you go back to the 100 rupees of incremental money that I has as an investor to invest, how would you break it up? And specific uh, call on real estate, there would be people who are probably thinking that that you know all-time crash that I'm waiting for in the last 10 years, maybe that's coming. So should I look at parking some money in, in real estate investment when that time comes? So real estate, uh, we've been negative for the last five years, okay. very vocally so. Uh, and we continue to be negative. Okay. Because I think, uh, I think it is overshot itself. Uh, residential, metro, real estate, because re everything in the country is real estate, yeah. right? So you have to be a little more specific. Metro residential real estate is a complete no-no. Okay. I think it will go through a time correction of at least three to four years uh, because it will take another 10, 15, 20 percent drop because if liquidity dries up and that kind of, there are about eight and a half lakh apartments to be sold with an average price of 78 lakhs in six cities in the country, okay. latest stat. And uh, we have uh, last stat which I saw was 2016, there were 42,700 people who have filed taxes more than a Mm. That's the size of our tax base. Uh, and those are the guys only who could afford a 1 crore, 2 crore apartment. Mm. So point being is real estate is something which is very scary. Uh, land and all the rest of them commercial could be a different ball game. But mm. most investors end up end up buying residential, residential property. Yeah, yeah. So point one. On the okay. gold side, I think you should have no gold unless you have any foreign objective to meet. 
could be a child's education because you in the long run you have to hedge your currency if you have your child's uh, education abroad then you if you are a person who is uh, who is fond of traveling then your that portion of money should be in dollar terms so that you don't escalate prices significantly mm -hmm. beyond uh, the inflation number which currency has the potential to infuse in your portfolio okay well uh, thank you very much to all of you for joining in have a wonderful wonderful festive season and hopefully we will see uh, a positive year a prosperous year as we step into the new samvat thank you very much for joining in once again a very happy diwali to all our viewers we'll see you again next week